Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second of our series of seminars which are designed to stimulate discourse on Albert Schweitzer's life and work. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who made this year's event possible, in particular Dr. James Carlton Paget, our host, and Simon Cook and Anne Gifford, as well as Debbie Mayhew and my colleague Max Brown, who's done a fabulous job in organising today's event. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome Her Excellency, Her Excellency the Governor's Ambassador and those who've flown in from overseas, <coughs> in particular Dr. Michael Tate from Princeton, Dr. Predrag Chikabaki from Massachusetts, Dr. Augustin Emane from the University of Nantes, and Dr. Sean Duffy, who's Executive Director of the Albert Schweitzer Institute here at Quinnipiac. Uh, Quinnip and all are very welcome today. Um, and today's conference is respectfully dedicated to David Ives, without whom there would be no such thing uh, as the Schweitzer Institute, either at Quinnipiac University or here in the UK. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. James Carlton Padgett. James is Senior Lecturer in New Testament Studies here at Cambridge. He's a Fellow and Tutor of Peter House, and he's co-editor of the Journal of Ecclesiastical History. And he's going to be speaking today on Albert Schweitzer in Cambridge University. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks very much, Ben, for organising what I hope will be a memorable event. This is a soup song at the beginning. It's not going to make a massive contribution to anything, but it at least has a local, um, something of local interest. So, Albert Schweitzer's first visit to Cambridge occurred in January of 1922 as he sought to rebuild his life after the First World War, for most of which he had been interned by the French authorities as a German citizen. In 1918, on his return to Strasbourg, his situation had appeared precarious. In debt to the parish missionary society to whom the mission station at Lamborini belonged, in ill health, also probably suffering from depression, held in suspicion by the strongly nationalistic French authorities now occupying Alsace, because he was married to a German woman and was perceived as pro-German, his prospects did not look good. However, by 1922, his circumstances had begun to improve, and thanks in part to the work of the ecumenically-minded Swedish Lutheran Archbishop of Uppsala, Nartan Söderblom, who had invited him to Sweden in 1920 to deliver a series of lectures and had promoted his cause with others, he was beginning to become to come to public prominence and to raise sufficient sums of money to countenance a return to Lamborghini, which would occur in 1924. While we know very little about the first visit to Cambridge in 1922, he appears to have delivered a lecture on the subject of the problem of eschatology. On the same visit, he delivered lectures at Oxford and in Birmingham, the latter of which would lead to the writing of a small but important book of Christianity and the religions of the world and may well have held an organ concert at Trinity College Chapel, it is probable that he came to the university mainly through the services of Francis Crawford Burkitt, at that time the Norician professor and a distinguished scholar in a variety of areas, including Semitic studies, text criticism, the New Testament, patristics, and strangely, the study of Francis of Assisi. Uh, can we have the first slide? I think it should be a slide of uh, Crawford. That might be a bit of Burkitt. There he is. Yes. Burkitt's acquaintance with Schweitzer went back more than a decade and was principally scholarly. Burkitt, like William Sandé of Oxford, the next slide, there's Sandé, looks slightly more Victorian, um, right, uh, was an early admirer of Schweitzer's quest of the historical Jesus, first published in 1905, with a new and considerably large edition in 1913. Burkitt's and Sandé's warm response to the quest, which Schweitzer recorded in his autobiography, reflected a wider interest in the subject of eschatology in Edwardian Britain, which was to be found in ecclesiastical as well as academic circles. For instance, there was a church congress held in Cambridge in 1910, a section of which was devoted to the subject of eschatology. And this, as Mark Chapman at the University of Oxford has shown, was but one of a number of such public discussions of the subject. While Sandé came to reject Schweitzer's interpretation of Jesus' ministry, as one dominated by eschatological hope, Burkitt did not. In fact, at the Church Congress of 1910, which I've just mentioned, Burkitt spoke up for Schweitzer's views in the face of some strong opposition. It was not just that Burkitt saw Schweitzer's conclusions as historically convincing, 
but he echoed his broader theological and hermeneutical concerns expressed in the quest, something which Schweitzer did not wholly appreciate when, in his biography, he contrasted Burkitt's, quote, purely scientific interest in his work with Sandé's more religiously oriented enthusiasm. Like Schweitzer, Burkitt argued strongly against the tendency among liberal critics of the Gospels to modernise Jesus' message. Such attempts at modernisation lose sight of the vitality of the real man, claimed Burkitt. What right have we to expect that counsel and warnings from so far away a source will have much echo in our surroundings? Also like Schweitzer, Burkitt saw something positive and important in Jesus' eschatological message, not least his capacity to puncture the complacency of the modern age, which too easily took its permanence for granted. Quote, the gospel is the great protest against the modern view that the really important thing is to be comfortable. And again, as long as we believe in our hearts that our property, our buildings, our trust deeds are the most permanent things in the world, so long we are not in sympathy with the gospel message. Burkitt's interest in Schweitzer's work is seen in Terralia in his efforts to have the first edition of the quest translated into English. This was done by Burkitt's pupil, William Montgomery. Interestingly, the translation of the second edition of the quest was initially undertaken by Susan Cupid, the wife of Don Cupid, formerly a lecturer in theology at this university, before, before the translation was completed by John Bowden in the year 2000. Burkitt added a preface to the translation, which ran to three pages. While admitting that Dr. Schweitzer's account does not pretend to be an impartial survey, he has his own views, which not everyone will endorse, Burkitt went on to note that his grasp of the nature and complexity of the great quest is even more remarkable, and its exposition cannot fail to stimulate us in England. And he finished by pleading with his readers not to avoid the eschatological thrust of the Christian message. From it could be drawn important lessons, the expectations of, of vindication and judgment to come, the imagery of the messianic feast, the otherworldliness against which so many eloquent words were spoken in the 19th century, are not to be regarded as regrettable accretions. These ideas of a Christian hope to be allegorised and spiritualised by us for our own use, but not to be given up for so long as we remain Christian at all. In 1955, in a letter accepting the award of an honorary degree by the university and addressed to the Vice-Chancellor Sir Henry Willick, Schweitzer acknowledged that the University of Cambridge was the door by which, in the beginning of the century, I entered England, noting Burkitt's support for the translation of the quest. And in a letter from the following year, also addressed to the Vice-Chancellor and written in German, he was clearer about his feelings of warmth towards Burkitt's support of him, stating that the latter had felt moved to help bring about the translation of the work of an unknown privat docent art that sent, you know, to someone who's sort of making their way in the academic world, a bit of a scrofulous figure, really. Burkitt was also to persuade Montgomery to translate Schweitzer's work on Paul and his interpreters, and much later, The Mysticism of Paul the Apostle, works which Burkitt also praised. Burkitt's and Schweitzer's relationship was a warm and convivial one, as is seen from a series of letters, mainly written by Burkitt to Schweitzer, which date between 1911 and 1934, and are housed in La Maison Schweitzer in Gunsbach, Alsace. These range from scholarly themes, the first letter, for instance, contains a set of very complimentary but learned remarks about Paul and his interpreters. Burkitt wrote these wonderful little um, postcards on which were scribbled all sorts of things uh, in very many different languages. Um, more general comments on the theological scene. It's a wonderful remark which um, um, Stephen Plant would enjoy, where uh, Burkitt notes that, the, that Bartians are not for the English. Uh, but also words of a personal kind in which Burkitt discusses happenings in his own family, inquires after Schweitzer's wife's health, or notes that he has been unable to find an au pair girl for Schweitzer's nephew. Some of the exchanges are intriguing, as when Burkitt explains why his interest in Francis of Assisi reflects his interests in the Gospels, or when he notes that he hopes that Montgomery's translation of Schweitzer's book on Paul will be widely read, but then comments a tad acerbically, that it will be neither your fault or his if this is not the case, but the disinclination of the English public from serious study of the New Testament. 
Birkett was also very interested in Schweitzer's musical talents, and a number of letters are pleased to him to come and play either the Trinity College Chapel organ or that of King's College Chapel. And some reveal that Birkett helped to raise money for Schweitzer's work in Africa, about which he was enthusiastic. Schweitzer was deeply saddened by news of the relatively early death of Birkett in 1935, and wrote to his widow, whose letter of response is in the archive in Gunsbach. There she writes, I knew you were one of those who would mourn his loss. There were so many subjects that bound you together in friendship, religion as well as theology, and that most noble music that the world has had, besides the personal friendship which drew you together. Touchingly, in what was to prove his last visit to Cambridge in October of 1955, Schweitzer took time out of a very busy schedule to visit Birkett's grave in Grantchester, and Birkett's granddaughter was one of those who attended the lunch which followed the ceremony. Schweitzer's visit to Britain in June of 1932, at a time when his fame had grown quite considerably, saw him visit Cambridge again. Little is known of this uh, occasion. Schweitzer appears to have given a lecture and played the organ. And it seemed to be of less importance than visits to Oxford, where he picked up an honorary doctorate in divinity, Edinburgh, where he was awarded one in divinity and in music, and St Andrews, one in laws. The same visit also saw him give a lecture at the University of Manchester, having played the organ at the cathedral um, and spoken on a subject which had interested him for some time, namely the philosophical development of Goethe. I mention this because Schweitzer's host on that occasion and the translator of the talk, Schweitzer used to speak in German on this occasion and speak for about a paragraph and then the translator would, give, uh, would, would speak in English give, giving a rough translation of what he just said. Um, I mentioned this because Schweitzer's host on that occasion, the translator of the talk, which was given in German, was C.H. Dodd. Since 1930, the second John Rylands Professor of Biblical Criticism and Exegesis in the university. And we have, interestingly, a number of detailed letters by Dodd concerning the arrangements for the visit, written in magnificent German. Uh, Dodd uh, really had good German. Um, on the death of Birkett, uh, if we could have Dodd, if we could have, oh, that's the next slide, there he is. Um, on the death of Birkett in 1935, Dodd was elected to Birkett's chair, now no longer the Norrishian chair, but the Norris Hulse chair, renamed because the former chair had now been amalgamated with the Hulsean chair, a post Dodd would hold until 1951. Dodd's relationship to Schweitzer was on a personal level not as close as that of Birkett, but was to be as intense as that of the latter intellectually, but from a quite different perspective. In contrast to Birkett's multidimensional warm embrace of Schweitzer's eschatological vision of Jesus, Dodd argued strongly in a number of places for a broad view of Jesus' eschatology as realised, claiming that strictly futurist apocalyptic views of eschatology came into being after the resurrection. This, in fact, was a position that a number of well-known British New Testament scholars, including J.A.T. Robinson, were to adopt. Similarly, he would argue in two essays entitled The Mind of Paul I and The Mind of Paul II, that, not snappy titles, but fine essays, mm -hmm. that though Paul began life as an enthusiastic apocalypticist, at the end of his life he had come to see ideas of a settled church, ecclesiology, replace a bold eschatological vision. Again, contrary to Schweitzer's own insistence on the permanent core of Paul's thought lying in an eschatologically driven vision. It is odd that in one of the letters Dodd wrote to Schweitzer, he praises the mysticism of Paul the Apostle, saying that he is in agreement with much of it. I don't quite think that's true. The extent of Dodd's wrestling with Schweitzer is not straightforwardly obvious from his books, at least if you count citations from the Alsatian. But certainly Schweitzer is a strong target. Something of the fervour of Dodd's opposition comes out, interestingly, in his copy of the second edition of Schweitzer's Quest, published in 1930. 13, with the title Die Leben Jesu Forschung, which positively overflows with critical handwritten glosses in German. My former PhD uh, supervisor, the immensely learned and delightful uh, Professor William Horbury, um, gave me the copy of Dodd's um, uh, version that I did. And all, as I say, all the glosses are in German. Uh, by Dodd. Uh, Schweitzer then had attracted the attention of two formidable figures of Cambridge theology, but in very different ways. Aside from a fleeting visit to Cambridge in December of 1935, where he met Birkett's recently widowed wife, who appears to have hosted him, and played the new organ at King's College, Schweitzer was to return to Cambridge once more in October of 1955, principally to receive an honorary degree. Cambridge, it seems, have been attempting to confer, confer such an honour upon him for some time. 
The Times reported the decision to do such a thing had been made as early as June of 1932, though this has not been confirmed by the university. Communications on this matter were apparently resumed in February of 1955, when the Vice-Chancellor of the University, already mentioned Sir Henry Willink, wrote a letter to Schweitzer stating that a decision had been made to offer him an honorary Doctor of Laws. An odd decision, one might think, as Schweitzer, for all his many gifts, did not count law amongst them. But Willink was clear about its appropriateness. Laws is for general excellence. A degree in medicine, music, or letters would be too specific. It's a very domish remark. Uh, Schweitzer replied from Lamborghini a month later in a lengthy letter from which I've already quoted, in which he outlined his warm feelings towards Cambridge and accepted the honour, stating that he would be unable to attend the ceremony fixed for June 1955. After some further toing and froing about the possibility of attending the ceremony in June of 1956, Willink wrote on the 26th of April 1955, asking if Schweitzer might be able to come to Cambridge at his convenience when the university would be prepared to lay on a special congregation of the Senate to confer the degree. Schweitzer accepted. This offer was probably made because in the course of the correspondence, Schweitzer had been made a member of the Order of Merit by the Queen. Only the second non-British figure after the then President Dwight Eisenhower of the United States to receive this honour, and he decided to visit England to receive it. This would not be in June, when as stated the, honor, the award of honorary degrees was normally made as it is still, but in October, and so the decision to call a special congregation was made. So this was a special congregation of the Senate, not, not, a, not, not, not one where you, lots of people come forward for their honorary degrees, or at least a relatively large number. Schweitzer's uh, visit to Britain attracted much attention. He even had a meeting with the Prime Minister, Anthony E. Can you have the next slide? There you are. Interesting. Uh, on, the same, on the same day, he received his OM from the Queen and held discussions with a range of British luminaries, including Augustus John and Bertrand Russell. Against this background of great public interest, Schweitzer arrived in Cambridge three days after he had received his Order of Merit from the Queen on October the 22nd. His first engagement was at Homerton College, at that time a teacher training college for women and with no direct correction to the university. He was to become a so-called approved society at the university in 1976 and then a fully-fledged college in 2000. Schweitzer's decision to go there was no doubt influenced by the fact that Clement Chesterton, we have the next, later Sir Clement Chesterton, yeah. Um, uh, a well-known missionary doctor in the Congo, whose hospital had greatly contributed towards the eradication of sleeping sickness in the area, was accompanying Schweitzer during his trip, and his daughter Hazel was a student at the college. During his visit to the college, Schweitzer briefly addressed the students in French. Can we have the next slide? There he is, addressing them, apparently. Um, and then we have the next one, too, because you'll see the rapt attention. There we are. Um, the talk, which took as its opening question, what should teachers teach their students, was a simplified version of Schweitzer's philosophy of reverence for life. Philosophy, Schweitzer noted, teaches us our duty towards society. It criticises, compares and eliminates. But our thought must not stop there. Must we not go deeper to the very depths of love and compassion? Where might one's compassion end? It cannot end. To whom do we owe love? We owe it to all living creatures. Life is irreplaceable, and although we do not understand this mystery, we owe respect to all life, to all forms of life which surround us. Now, I think, is, is the next, do you see the next slide? Yes. Is, is the, no, don't, don't let's go on to that one at the moment. We'll just come. Schweitzer and his entourage, well, uh, um, Schweitzer and his entourage then moved to the Senate House on what was a damp and rainy day. The Times noted that seldom indeed has the Senate House witnessed a greater concourse or a more spontaneous welcome than that given yesterday. Floor and galleries were packed and in the Senate House yard, another large crowd, undaunted by the rain, acclaimed Dr. Schweitzer with enthusiasm. And another uh, newspaper, unidentified but available in the Homerton archive, commented that people even climbed the outside window ledges in the hope of being able to witness even a small part of the brief ceremony. Aspects of this description were caught on the short Pathé newsreel of the event. Let's play that. Big numbers on a great man for the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws, 80 year old Dr. Albert Schweitzer, Owen. Half a century ago, he was already world famous both as a philosopher and as a musician. To these attainments, he added a medical degree and left.
to Europe to found a labor hospital in Africa, where he has worked ever since. An outstanding citizen of the world, Britain is proud to honor him. There we are. Well, ironically, there's lots of mistakes, but it's, it, it captures something. Um, the ceremony itself took about 10 minutes. Um, the university orator, a fellow of Peterhouse, the college in which you find yourself today, and Lawrence Professor of Ancient Philosophy, W.K.C. Guthrie, could we have the next slide? Oh, that, that's, that's, that's the speech she gave, that's the speech in French to the Homerton um, crew. If we could go to the next one, which I think will give a picture of it, it's a rather sturdy picture of Guthrie. Um, began by stating that Schweitzer's acceptance, and this is my translation, or rough translation of the Latin, because it was up in Latin, um, by stating that Schweitzer's acceptance of the confer of a degree brought honour upon the university rather than vice versa. Repeating a well-known trope in accounts of Schweitzer's life, Guthrie exclaimed that the honorand could easily have had a distinguished academic career had he not preferred to follow the call of his lord. Though partially correcting himself, Guthrie noted that Schweitzer had in fact achieved a great deal in a number of fields. Indeed, I cannot say whether we should first claim him as a physician, a philosopher, or a theologian, or rather as a lover of music and a skillful and moving performer. But Guthrie concluded that it was his work for, to quote, his brother in Africa, that should take precedence over any intellectual or aesthetic achievements, concluding by quoting from 1 Corinthians 13. But one thing above all should his presence bring home to us, that though a man must speak with the tongues of men and of angels, though he have the gift of prophecy and understand all knowledge and all mysteries, if he has not charity, he is become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In all humility, let us salute this faithful soldier of Christ, seeing in him an example of Christian charity long to be remembered by ourselves and by our children. So you capture something of the adulatory tone that surrounded this man at the time. After the ceremony, Schweitzer went to lunch at Christ College, where he was entertained by the Vice-Chancellor, W.C. Downs, then Master of the College, and the Chancellor of the University, Lord Tedder, the former Air Chief Marshal. In a letter written to Guthrie from London just two days after his visit, Schweitzer regretted that he had not been able to talk with him for longer, noting that he had been whisked away to see an organ. He praised Guthrie's speech as simple, yet formally perfect, without knowing me who understood my life. After more words in praise of the speech and the privileged character of his own life, Schweitzer expressed the hope that he and Guthrie would meet again, and on such an occasion they might have an opportunity to speak at greater length about philosophy. Schweitzer concluded his letter by stating that he would be writing to the Vice-Chancellor's office to request at least 12 copies of Guthrie's speech for friends and relatives. Now, I could go on to say a little bit more, but I'm not going to about uh, those people who are interested, who, in, who, 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 who studied in Cambridge and have been distinguished people and interested in him. just want to note a personal thing. That is that at the of Mac 15, uh, a programme came on television, The Sea of Faith. Do you remember this programme? It was a, it was a great moment uh, in, um, in television and done by Don Cupid. And my interest in Albert Schweitzer was sparked by his discussion of Albert Schweitzer in, in that, on that programme. Um, and we could mention others, for instance, uh, Christopher Rowland, who spent most of his time, of course, in Oxford, but was here as an undergraduate and deeply influenced by Schweitzer. But I want to just finish with some concluding remarks. In the letter of Sir Henry Willing accepting his honorary degree at Cambridge, dated March 14, 1955, Schweitzer, as I have already stated, claimed that Cambridge had been the door through which he entered Britain. And certainly Burkitt, for the reasons stated above, played a significant role in bringing Schweitzer to the public's attention. It would, however, be an exaggeration to claim that, uh, that Cambridge was an important part of Schweitzer's life. Indeed, there are arguments for saying that Oxford was more significant. Schweitzer visited it more often and gave at least one substantial lecture series there. And in his autobiography, he named William Sanday, perhaps slightly above Burkitt, as a very significant promoter of his work, even though Sanday, which Sartre doesn't mention, came to reject his own ideas about Jesus. However we assess Cambridge's significance in Schweitzer's life, however, two things are worth noting. First, Schweitzer's friendship with two Cambridge giants of British theology, Francis Burkitt and Charles Dodd, is a reminder of his significance as a theologian and of the greater attention, at least early on, that his work received in Britain as opposed to German attention and also appreciation, especially as this related to Jesus. Both Burkitt and Dodd, whose lives were almost exclusively academic, were deeply affected by his scholarship, even if their reactions to it diverged. And of his academic endeavours, it is his work as a New Testament scholar that continues to attract interest. Secondly, the visit to Cambridge in 1955 witnesses to the striking celebrity status 
Schweitzer once had. I, when you see those extraordinary scenes in the Seneca's, one's reminded really of the scenes of Stephen Hawking's funeral, you know, very large numbers of people, and they, they stretched all the way down King's Parade. Um, this predated the Second World War with celebrity, but became especially marked after it. As the Pathé recording shows, and to some extent Guthrie's speech, it was not so much Schweitzer's work as a theologian and philosopher which made waves, but his often imperfectly understood activities in Lamborghini, perceived as an act of great good and self-sacrifice. And it would be precisely these which, in a world becoming more sceptical of colonialism, would lead to the emergence of a more negative reassessment of his moral standing among some. The juxtaposition of this celebrity, of which the Cambridge visit was but one instantiation, and the relative lack of knowledge concerning Schweitzer now is striking and serves as a marked qualification to the final words of Guthrie's address, which spoke of Schweitzer's Christian charity as long to be remembered by ourselves and by our children. How to explain Schweitzer's relative fall from public consciousness is the subject of another paper. Thank you very much.